uh, for the next 25 minutes or so, we're going to talk a bit about color and space and how we can use Node to explore those with a few of my favorite core modules and also some fun toys. So this is a color wheel from Wikipedia. It's about 200 years old. And I included it because I think it demonstrates that there's a bit of a history to thinking about color in terms of space. But we've made some progress since then. And as developers, this is, this is our color wheel. So I know it's Node, but it's still JavaScript. So how many people here are or have been or sometimes are front-end developers? <laughs> so we should be familiar with this, right? This is a reference point. It's a tool we use to communicate with the machine about a color when we want to pick a hover state. It's what we use as a reference point when we're communicating with other developers or designers. It's sort of the starting point for thinking about color. But it's sort of incomplete, and uh, I think we can do better. So we're going to start with this little guy. It's called Elite Motion, and it detects gestures. Uh, it's in a little infrared camera. It translates the position of your hand into some numbers, which we'll look at. And we can use that to control these, which are uh, Lifix light bulbs. They are smart Wi-Fi-enabled multi-colored LED bulbs. They're a good example of the whole Internet of Things thing. Uh, and we can use them to think through uh, color in a bit more creative a way. So let's dive right into some of the code and start figuring out how we can use it, plug these things together. So this is how the interface for the leap motion works. We get a leap object from the kindly provided uh, node module that the company produces. And we call loop. And we get a frame uh, value for each time the camera takes a picture. So let's see exactly what that gets us. OK, so a little too much. Um, it's nice to know it's there, but we can actually just make do with one of the values that they're providing, which is a stabilized palm position, which is almost exactly what it sounds like. And let's see what that gets us. OK, so still a little quick, but we've got some numbers, and that's something we can work with. It's important to note that there are three of them, and that should remind us of another three numbers. We'll get to that, though. So. Uh, just expanding it a little bit, since we got those positions and we're not really sure where they are, we're just going to normalize those values by keeping track of the maximum and minimum uh, for each dimension, and then use those to map our incoming hand positions to a decimal value, something between 0 and 1. So, OK, now this is something we can work with. We can start thinking about how we could map those values to colors. Whoops. But that begs the question of how we're going to get that data into the light bulbs. And I'm going to do something here that I'm a little concerned will spark some backlash and show uh, a little bit of code in another language to demonstrate the core module that I want to think about, which is how Node is good at working with processes. So this is a little bit of Ruby. This is, the, uh, this is a small script to give us access to the official client library for the Lifix, which happens to be in another language. There's a lot of reasons why we might want to use the official library. The protocol for communicating with the bulb is sort of semi-private. Presumably, the API they expose is going to remain stable. So you know, this is the safest way to ensure ourselves against future changes to that. But how are we going to call that from Node? Well, fortunately, we have the convenient child process module, which allows us to just take uh, our Ruby command, run our little Ruby script, and we're going to wait for it to tell us that it's ready, uh, which it will do after it discovers the lights. And then, uh, I've highlighted that for clarity, uh, and then we can do exactly as we were doing before, map our values, but now we're going to multiply them by 255, which is the range for RGB colors, uh, and then just pipe it in through standard in into that little Ruby script. OK, so now the colors change, but pretty slowly, uh, even though the numbers are going pretty fastly. Um, that's, uh, that's because the data comes in a little bit too quickly for the bulbs to handle. So this is some sort of quick and dirty throttling. We'll keep track of each time we get a frame. Uh, and then if it's been less than a quarter of a second, we'll just ignore that frame uh, before moving on. OK, now we have what we want. When we move around, we can pick a color. So this is the green dimension, or red, 
etc. So now let's pick a color to, to actually pick. Uh, let's go with the nice green that is the sort of conference theme for those keeping track. It's apparently 79C567. Um, let's see if we can deliberately reproduce that color with our lights now that we have a color picker type thing. So put green in the middle, but it's a little too not pale enough. So which direction would be paler? It would be sort of like red and blue, I guess, because those are the opposite of green. Um, the point I'm trying to make is that it's not necessarily completely intuitive because the map of color, the color space that is produced by the RGB system doesn't map very well to the way we think about color when we're thinking about light. It works for mixing pigments, but it's a different situation when we're talking about the colors of lights because you can't mix in the red and the blue, or you can't subtract the red and the blue from the green to get uh, the paler green. So thinking about this cube, we can modify it to produce a more intuitive color space. If we rotate it a little bit and then flatten it, we get our color wheel back. And this is actually how that is produced. The blue, purple, there's another name for it, magenta, uh, red, orange, uh, yellow, green, cyan. They're the primary colors in both the, from the way we, we manipulate constituent parts of light color and the constituent parts of pigment. But as we know, this isn't a full color picker. We also have to have our third dimension for lightness or darkness. And when you combine these and rotate our little disk and add that dimension, you get the HSL or HSV color spaces. These represent a uh, color using a 360 degree disk, the place we started, and a range in the HSL case uh, from dark to light, or in the HSV case, uh, dark to full saturation, and then lightness is on the axial dimension, um, and saturation kind of goes like this. So now we have a different way to try to pick a color. Now back very briefly to Rubyland. Uh, before we were just sending in three numbers separated by a comma. Now we're also going to send the name of a color space. Uh, but we're going to modify our outbound script a little bit to use streams uh, instead of just callbacks. Uh, we're actually already using one stream because the child process gives us a writable stream. That's how we're able to send data to it. But let's make our own stream for our leap motion. So we'll use the streamed module and create a new readable stream. And then each time the leap motion runs its loop, uh, we'll push that value into our stream after we've mapped it to our uh, desired HSV. So the HSV takes decimals for the last two values, and the first one, as I mentioned, is 360 degrees. Uh, so we map that, push it onto the stream, and then we can extract our uh, drop every quarter second thing into its own stream, a transformation stream. Uh, so I skipped something. We push each color onto the stream. We also have to define an underscore read function. This is the signature for the streams API. We're not doing anything here. It's how we would apply back pressure in a more sophisticated implementation of this to, to rate control the input of uh, color values. But for now, we're just using our simple drop every quarter drop if it's more recent than a quarter second. We can do that with a transform stream, which we create, define an underscore transform function, and then in that stream, just push onto the subsequent stream if it's been more than a quarter second, and we, that last callback function is what tells the previous stream that it's ready for a new value. And that gives us the opportunity to produce, to uh, phrase the actual bulk of our program in what I think is a very sort of nice and expressive single line, get our leap stream, pipe it to our skipper, pipe that into the standard in for our child process. So now we have a different color space. We can move through, I have to establish the range, I guess. Okay. So we can move through the spectrum according to those 360 degrees. We can also make it brighter or less bright and also control saturation. So when, now when we're trying to think about or saturation, so now when we want to think about picking our green color, we can say, okay, that's green, but we want to desaturate it a bit. Lost my hand.
Now, the, the, the actual details of picking color this way are a little fuzzy. It's not necessarily the most practical approach, but you get the idea that there's different color spaces that we can model as representations in literal space using these tools. So, last little bit. Uh, we're going to now do, make one little tweak to our sort of client code uh, and accept a label for one of the three lights so that in our outbound script, we can now map uh, left, right, center to three streams and we'll take our outbound leap stream and apply a new transform stream to it uh, that we'll call rotate that takes the value and rotates the hue by 120 degrees, by one third. So it's the other angle, uh, one of the other two angles on that color wheel. So if we do this, they're all going to be different, but now we have to move slowly because they'll freak out, oh, they're doing it. Um, but what we can do by moving through it is to essentially rotate, that's an interesting thing they're doing. We can. We're essentially, though not particularly clearly, rotating that wheel, making one light represent each corner of it and then changing th that angle. So I think this is a great deal of fun, um, but I think that we can actually learn something about why Node is useful from this. So we get there by way of something of a digression there's an exper a thought experiment in theory of mind about Mary the color scientist. Has anyone heard this one before? Great. So it goes something like this. There's a scientist named Mary. She has absolutely perfect knowledge of the way human vision works. Cone for cone, rod for rod, neuron for neuron, absolutely everything about the, the biophysics of the way humans receive photons and turn that into a conscious representation. Mary knows everything about it. But Mary never leaves her lab, and her lab is entirely in black and white. And so sort of riff uh, around this thought experiment is, if Mary leaves the lab and sees a bright blue bicycle and a beautiful orange sunset, will she be surprised? Or will she be like, obviously, that's what color is. I've known all along how color worked. Gets into this whole thing about whether there's more to perception than the mechanics of it, whatever. But that's not what I want to get into. What I want to speculate about is whether what we've done here is a how we, I want to speculate how what we've done here can apply to that sort of thinking or that sort of question. So while this might be our cube with color, this is Mary's cube, and those arrows don't really mean anything because their reference don't exist in this black and white world. So this can't be used to pick a color. But these are Mary's HSL and HSV spaces. These are Mary's this thing. That conceptual mapping still makes sense because color for color's sake is only one dimension, that 360 degrees, of these representations. So saturation, uh, though it might beg the question of what, can still be understood as a measure of intensity. Value uh, or lightness can still be understood in a black and white world. So we have a spatial representation that allows us to think about something that we don't fully understand in a new and different way. I think Node is particularly good at this sort of representation because Node is good at represent Node is good at representing this sort of thing because its constituent parts are events and streams and other things that map well to actions and to actions and inputs and outputs. I don't think this is an accident. Node's legacy as coming from JavaScript, the language of the browser, makes it a good fit for human actions and reactions. The event loop model uh, is a good fit for people interacting with browsers or people interacting with new inputs and new outputs. And I think Node is a great fit for the new types of devices that are becoming more available. And uh, I'm excited to see what people do with them. And I think this is just sort of a starting point, And I hope you enjoyed it. Um, went a little bit too quick, but thank you. The uh, code for those demo from those little samples is up on GitHub as is a larger sort of full-scale application version if you are interested. And these are some more historical color spheres, uh, which I think are cute. Um, I have plenty of time for questions. What's purple? Magenta? What is purple? Can you just describe it? So, <laughs> I think it's like uh, 260 
and then like 0 0.5, 0 0.5 if you want your average purple. So, yes, and I, I did a version of this once before, and the same question was asked by a person who had a color vision deficiency. Uh, and uh, it's not something that's easy to speculate about because I uh, have to go find subjects and I don't know. But that is the idea, that we can take these conceptual mappings that we have that we use to describe things and render them accessible in a different way. Um, how that would work as an actual tool, as opposed to a fun experiment, uh, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, I actually, I just went to Jeff Color Spaces on GitHub and I got a form of form. Oh. I'm exploring color spaces. Yeah, so I'm going to fix that. <laughs> No. We do cars. Cars come in colors. <laughs> Pigments. Not light. Here. So there was an initial question about whether this could actually have, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, a practical application for people that have a color vision deficiency or are color blind. Um, I said I didn't think it would make a particularly good desktop tool but that the idea that we can represent qualities using a different mapping uh, is what I think is interesting about these technologies and how we can link them together using something that gives us tools like streams and events such as Node. And then there was a question about why I used the wrong word in the GitHub link, um, which I apologized for. Okay.